Hi, everybody. Thank you, Dr. Uh, Saunders. I welcome the panelists to uh, join us. Um, we agree that regarding the fact that Dr. Uh, Saunders is in, uh, in active duty for Her Majesty government, we are not able to ask her questions, though I have many, many questions I would like to address you, but not today. But we have um, five members of the panel, distinguished, great panel, which first I would like to address. The, uh, the panel is titled New Global Order, Global Perspective of Policy and Intelligence Leaders. Which is basically, which basically means that we can say whatever we want, address whatever question we'd like, uh, generally enough. And uh, I have called that a non-Israeli centric panel. We would like to see the world as it's seen from the point of view of the panelists. Um, Mr. Marcel Letra is the Vice President of National Security at Lockheed Martin. The former, the former U.S. Under Secretary of Defense for Intelligence, where and when he exercised authority, direction, and control of the, on behalf of the Secretary of Defense over all intelligence and security organizations within the Department of Defense. Mr. Tamir Pardo is the former chief of the Israeli Mossad from 2011 to 2016. Before that, and during more than 40 years in the Israeli defense community, Mr. Pardo held various staff and operational commands starting with the elite Sayeret Matkal and Shaldag units, and after that joining the Mossad, serving many intelligence and operational duties until appointed head of Rainbow, the Special Operation Division, and later Mossad Dep Deputy Chief. Ambassador Victoria Nuland is the Chief Executive Officer at the Center for a New American Security and the former U.S. Assistant Secretary of State for European and Eurasian Affairs. A U.S. diplomat for 32 years, Ambassador Nuland at various high-ranking positions, including State Department spokesperson during Secretary Clinton's tenure, U.S. Ambassador to NATO, and Deputy National Security Advisor to Vice President Dick Cheney. Lieutenant, Lieutenant General Kandera is the former Director General of the Indian Defense Intelligence Agency and former Deputy Chief of the Indian Integrity, Integrated Defense Staff. Last but not least, Major General Jonathan Shaw is the Chairman of Optima and former UK Assistant Chief of Defense Staff on Policy. General Shaw has 32 years of experience in the UK Army, during which time he commanded operations in every rank up to two stars. He has gained extensive operational experience in the Falkland, Bosnia, Kosovo, Iraq, and Afghanistan. Um, I wanted to ask to start with a question that I think everybody would like to address nowadays, and this is about what President Trump is going to announce soon. The panelists, however, prefer to answer this at the later part of the discussion. So we will start with a, from other topics. Um, and I would like to start with you, Ambassador Nuland. I hear great frustration from Israeli defense and uh, intelligence um, uh, officials they claim that the U.S. has practically evacuated the Middle East, that it has no policy on Syria, no policy on other uh, things, that it dated back to mistakes that were done by President Obama and repeatedly done by President Trump. We are looking at the future. What future do you see for the U.S. and U.S. policy in this region? Well, thanks, Ronan, and it's terrific to be here at Herzliya, also my first time at this conference. Uh, like you, like, like many Israelis, the number one geostrategic trend that worries me the most is the one that Ronan identified, whether the United States is in fact first beginning under the Obama administration but now accelerating at a dangerous pace under the Trump administration, withdrawing from our historic responsibilities at least since the establishment of this world order at the end of the Cold War. And if we have lost our will to both in regions like this one, but globally, maintain peace and stability, open markets, encourage uh, d the promotion of democracy, encourage those uh, who want to pursue uh, more open societies as, as we have. And as Leanne made clear, you know, this world order that we have helped build and presided over has resulted in unprecedented prosperity, technology, growth for so many people. It is an aberration in human history. 
So it is a frustration not just in the Middle East that we now seem to have overlearned the lessons of Iraq, if you will, that somehow uh, the exercise of American leadership, not simply American military power, but our convening power, our ability to create common cause among countries to solve problems, whether it's uh, decades of, of work on uh, Israeli-Palestinian issues or whether it's our reticence to become involved except on the ISIS case uh, in Syria and now allowing a situation where we have regional powers, six of them faced off with militaries across a region just north of this country in very dangerous ways to our incoherence on situations like the Iranian situation where we're obsessed with an issue, the nuclear issue, on which we actually have an agreement to keep that problem tamped down for the next eight years, but we're not paying sufficient attention to the real threat from Iran, which is the territorial expansion. And that's where we ought to be bringing together countries like Israel, Jordan, Turkey, the Gulf, the European countries to ex uh, exact a settlement that can bring peace and stability before this region becomes a powder cake once again. So that's what worries me. Thank you. Um, Mr. Lettre, the Pentagon just issued a new defense strategy, which basically deals with two main topics. One would be a new technology change, a new technology challenge. And the other one was the reigniting uh, re re of the return of great power competition, Russia, China, versus maybe the declining power of the United States. How does that fit into the global challenges that we are all facing? Yeah, thank you, Ronan. I think um, this builds actually uh, quite a bit on Ambassador Newland's comments about the degree to which the U.S. will continue to exercise leadership uh, in this region as well as around the globe. As you pointed out, um, there is a new national defense strategy that uh, the Pentagon under Secretary Jim Mattis has put out. Um, and it is worth a read. It's, it is an important document um, for the reasons that, that you ju just mentioned. Um, two big takeaway messages in that document from my perspective. Number one, uh, there is uh, a trend of rapid technological change which is affecting the security landscape, a democratization in some ways of, uh, and the ease with which uh, actors, both good and bad, can access technology uh, to do ill will on others. And secondly, uh, a sense, at least from the Pentagon's perspective, of the return of interstate competition, great power competition, essentially, Russia, China, um, challenging the U.S. for spheres of in influence and engaging in, in activity that uh, the U.S. Uh, has, has some concern about. And so what that has led us to, uh, if you look at the U.S.'s military instrument of power, is I think a conscious decision on the part of the Pentagon to look at how to invest capability and innovation to deal with this great power competition dynamic. That means that over the next couple of years, I think you will see a conscious effort on the Pentagon's part to make those investments in capability uh, to be well positioned against a high-end competitor um, in contingency operations that require operating in a contested environment, the further pursuit of fifth generation capability of innovations around artificial intelligence and autonomous systems, and uh, a speed and agility um, pursued in the way we acquire things to do things differently. And that has to be done in conjunction with allies and partners, of course. But I think that rebalancing that the ambassador mentioned, and in some cases arguably a, a vacuum that, that emerges in some parts of the globe from the lack of U.S. leadership, is in part uh, a conscious decision by the Pentagon uh, to look at the global responsibilities that the U.S. has and make some investments in a different way than we've seen in years past. Thank you. Um, General Kundry, we just said that you were the Deputy Chief of Staff of the Integrated um, Indian Army. If you are now the chief of staff, what would you, what would keep you awake at night? What are your main concerns? Uh, thank you, Ronan. And uh, firstly, I would uh, like to thank General Amos Gillard for having called me. It's not very often that uh, the Indian voice is heard. And in the perspective of the uh, global uh, issues, especially the New World Order, 
And uh, if we were to look at the entire globe, uh, the world order, and then subsequently the Asian part, the ambassador has also brought out, and earlier also it has been said, uh, demography, economics, technology, these are the issues. What is the most important part which affects India is the terrorism in our neighborhood. And that is what is the biggest concern for India. Along with the demographic issues, the terrorism and the radicalized and the fanatic spread of certain ideology, which is what concerns us most. We are OK. India is OK with the changing world order that is bound to happen. We are ready to absorb that. But at the same time, there is an expectation that the new world order should have uniform standards on issues of terrorism, whether it is in one part of the world or other part of the world. And that is the biggest requirement that we feel in whichever announcement is done by whichever global leader. And that is what is required in the new world order. Thank you. Tamir Pardo, um, during your time as chief of the Mossad, you ordered to invest enormous efforts into technological development, cyber. Um, and at the same time, Israel created some coordination with Russia in uh, Syria. Now, Russia is considered to be a prime threat by many countries. Is it a threat? Is it concern from the Israeli point of view? I hope so. Um, I think the big question today is not uh, do we understand the Russians. I don't think we do. But uh, do we understand our planet? We are living in a global village for a very long time. Uh, we had tremendous changes that took place in the last 100 years. Think that on this planet, just 100 years ago, 1.5 billion people were living. Now we are 7.5. People are living today, 20 in average, 22 years more than they used to live just 60 years ago. And technology. We are living in a different world. But unfortunately, we are using the same algorithm that we used in the old world. And moreover, I think by understanding not the benefit of the technological revolution that's supposed to give us better life and better understanding, Unfortunately, politicians are using that technology as cyber hackers are using it. They are part of the game. And that's a very dangerous thing. And I think that, unfortunately, we don't understand Russia. I heard a story of uh, uh, some colleagues that visited Russia less than a year ago. Uh, they were... Um, from, let's say, NATO uh, generals, and they met the Russians, and uh, you can, you can they say wanted wh from to which country. There are no journalists here. There's no Never mind. They discussed, they discussed the Ukraine crisis, and the Russian generals, very respected one, said, you are talking on Ukraine, we are talking on the Second World War, how you betrayed us. They are living in a different world. They have a different paradigm. And uh, we don't understand them. So I think the game that they are playing here in this region is a very dangerous one. And with the, the unclear, saying the least, to the American policy, foreign policy, I think that might be the big winners, unfortunately. Thank you. General Shaw, I would like to ask you the same question of one of the main concerns that Britain has 
this time, but I would like to take it from what Tamir Pado just said about the Russians. Britain was attacked by Russia or Russians. Don't you think that this was a result of the fact that the West did not react to other targeted killing and assassination that were allegedly connected to Russia before and what Britain should be doing now after the Scripple uh, affair? Um, so, yes, I think there's definitely something in it that if there's a habit of uh, Putin's it to exploit weakness and when you detect weakness to keep pushing. So I think there's an argument there. I think the difficulty for Britain is that we are no longer a great empire ruling the world. We're now a small player and working out where we sit. And when we sit in the sort of tidal wave in the world, what we're observing now is that uh, we're exchanging the Atlanticist uh, 20th century for a Eurasian 21st century. And that poses an existential dema dilemma for all countries that uh, place their security on the United States, of which Israel and the United Kingdom are two. Um, and indeed, when we come on later and talk about Iran, you'll see the reaction in, in uh, Europe perhaps as a bellwether of whether we go Atlanticist or whether we go Eurasian. Um, because all the trends are moving away from the Atlantic century to a Eurasian future. You can see that the influence of China, uh, you can see that uh, in Russia reasserting itself. And if you look at the enthusiasm with which the British Chancellor leapt towards Chinese money when it was offered uh, to the distraught of America, you'll see the appeal, the growing appeal of China uh, attracting people to it. And that is fundamentally altering the balance of the world order. Uh, away from what we've been used to since 1945. The Russian context in that is that uh, so much of the Russians put, their, put so much of their money into London, and so, so much of our money uh, is therefore tied up it, with the Russians, and we find it much more difficult in, in uh, London to uh, prosecute the Russians like we might wish to, and it's been up to the Americans to put sanctions on uh, Putin's oligarchs, and we watch that with interest. But yes, your Betty's point is right, is that if you show weakness, people will exploit it, so there is a need to be strong. Ambassador Nuland, do you think that the US should take a much more aggressive and power politics against the Russians? I think ag aggressive is, is the wrong word to use, but I was reminded as the general was talking about exploiting weakness of the great uh, adage assigned to Lenin, uh, he used to, he's, quoted as saying, thrust in the bayonet. When you hit bone, stop. When you hit mush, keep pushing. So we need to, uh, both with Russia and with China, and I think this is the expectation of the new US national security strategy. It remains to be seen if we can actually put policy against the stated strategy that we need to encourage the best from both Russia and China while containing, deterring, blunting, uh, exposing the worst. So it's not necessarily a question of saying all Chinese investment is bad. It's a matter of being transparent about where the money's coming from, about where it's going, about ensuring that we are not uh, giving up strategic advantage or giving away our uh, strategic assets in the process. Similarly with Russia, Putin's played a weak hand very strongly because we haven't been playing at all, uh, whether it is on confronting their violations of the Intermediate Nuclear Forces Agreement, whether it is in uh, dealing appropriately with the situation in Syria, we, as we talked about before, whether it is in responding collectively as a free and democratic family to the violations of our sovereignty and messing with our elections. These are not uh, insurmountable problems to create some bone against, but we have not been unified in doing it. Similarly, Russia is not monolithic. It is uh, not doing well economically. We could go through that at, any, at great length. Putin's run through half of the sovereign wealth fund that he had during the high days of oil. So there are incentives to be had and put on the table for a Russia that comes back to the rules of the road economically in particular. And we are again not playing that affirmative card either. So we now need to put some strategy against this 
declared challenge, and it remains, again, to be seen whether the U.S. can lead in that and bring other allies along. General Conrad, you said, you referred yes, before about, you talked about terrorism, you talked about the definition of terrorism. You didn't say Pakistan, but it seems to me that you were thinking about Pakistan. So does Pakistan is still your prime adversary, and ISI is the making of most of your problems? Uh, yes, uh, Ronan, you're right. Sorry I for being direct. I'm just trying to have I a more specific answer. No, as a journalist, you obviously could read what was going on in my mind, <laughs> and I compliment you for that. Although you said there are no journalists here, you, you're one and uh, the leading one. Thank you. Uh, yes, definitely. Uh, as uh, Israel looks at terrorism all around, and uh, you are focused to a particular neighbor, and earlier also it has been said that it is synonymous with terrorism, and there's an existential threat. Similarly, in uh, our context, it is not only a conventional threat, uh, we have collusive threat uh, with two countries trying to be uh, collusive and uh, adversaries for us. And uh, unfortunately, or as things stand, uh, one of them uh, is a bigger player in the new uh, world order. And uh, for a country like India, which is democratic, which is pluralistic in uh, nature, we have different communities, we have a secular nature, and then suddenly when you are faced with a problem of terrorism, which is a state-sponsored terrorism, and it upsets the growth, and it definitely plays a key role in the new world order. And uh, that is something which I was uh, mentioning. In addition to what we were talking of, how information is being used, I'm going to use a very strong term that weaponization of the social media has created many more problems and whether it is with uh, the terrorism or even whether it is with the uh, new world order, I think this is one new dimension that has got added and that needs to be taken into account by any country when you take policy decisions. And that is the challenge for the intelligence leaders and the policy makers. Yeah, which takes us to a, to a total new and challenging sphere, Marcel Atre. It's the, the, the social media, social network, and campaigns which are done through that um, perspective and, and paradigm. Um, is, it, is it doable for intelligence service to, to even try to incorporate a war on that sphere? Yeah, there, there are two dimensions when you bring up uh, social media. One is the effects and implications in the intelligence sphere, and the other is uh, more broad in terms of the strategic um, impacts or implications for policy. On, on intelligence, um, what we're finding with the changing, changing technological landscape across a range of areas is the need to adapt how we do intelligence uh, to gain insight from new sources of information, from new sensor networks, uh, from new capabilities. Um, one of the networks of information that has emerged over the last decade is social media. Um, and it, it has shown its power and its ability to do nefarious deeds um, with, uh, for example, the, um, both Al-Qaeda and ISIS leveraging social media very effectively to recruit operatives and uh, conduct attacks to include inspiring lone wolf actors from thousands of miles away. Uh, we also have the opportunity with um, intelligence and information analytics to leverage social media to understand dynamics that are occurring um, around the globe in, in real time um, as a force for good, uh, to understand the impacts of a natural disaster uh, and how quickly we need to respond as first responders to the areas of most urgent need and for national security purposes. So this is one of those key areas where from an intelligence perspective, we need innovative thinking uh, coupled with very thoughtful work around privacy and civil liberties and the policies associated with that uh, to look for ways to uh, take advantage of opportunity to do good here. I'll just briefly touch upon the policy aspects um, which is that some of the nefariousness that has occurred through social media, uh, we all know, um, it is from 
its use as a toolkit in influence operations. Specifically, in the U.S., we've been greatly concerned about Russian influence operations in the U.S. context. And that is something that, frankly, in the U.S., we're just getting our arms around um, as a recognizing this as a powerful asymmetric tool uh, that can be impactful on an open and free and democratic society. And we need, need to come up with both policy and operational countermeasures to that kind of hybrid warfare attack um, on an open and free and democratic society. Yeah. And the new channels also bring the proliferation of very powerful SIGINT and social media tools to private hands. Um, hacking tools, the ability to launch uh, intensive campaigns, um, and, and uh, encryption tools. Tamir Pardo, so this is where the real intelligence war is happening, SIGINT and social media, and not the old time, whatever, targeted killings? Well, <laughs> I must, um, cyber in general, Speaking, generally speaking, from my point of view, is a soft and silent uh, nuclear weapon. And, uh, but we must understand, we can use it against the Russians, but uh, we can use it against ourselves at the same time. Uh, without comparing, but the moment when we are talking about uh, all those capabilities, um, and just understand that, uh, for instance, President Trump used the Twitter 2,500 times in his first year. He addressed the American people and the world. Just last night, he told us that he's going to uh, talk about Iran uh, tonight by the Twitter. So we want to use those capabilities uh, in order to launch, uh, let's say, uh, attacks on Iran on one hand, or on Russia, but uh, we are using it uh, to uh, ruin our own system. And we must be very careful, because when you have a weapon in your hand, if you are not using it properly, you can get the heat from this weapon, and you can get the attack on yourself at the same time, and it's much easier. And I think that at the very beginning, when we saw all those capabilities, uh, we were very um, enthusiastic, because we can use it against our adversaries. But at the same time, it's so cheap that everyone almost can use it against us. Um, uh, using those capabilities can ruin societies very easily. Um, I don't know, I haven't seen the report on the uh, Russian intervention in the United States during the last election, uh, but uh, if they did, so uh, their achievement uh, was quite great compared to the efforts that it, they should invest in it with a bunch of, uh, uh, let's say, smaller, um, let's say, I'm going to say 25 or between 25 and 50 people, you have created damage that uh, armored division couldn't achieve in a very short time and without a fingerprint. And that's the weapon that uh, is used today, but beware. It can be against yourself or it can get it used can use it against yourself at the same time. General Shaw, we're talking about the new world order, but what order is that when a person like Edward Snowden takes away your secrets, NSA secrets, Israeli secrets, and forced everybody into a coerced striptease in front of the world? And nothing is, not that I'm calling for that, but nothing is done to him, and he is enjoying life in Moscow. 
Yes, I think the whole phrase world order is, uh, should be in, in quotes right now because I'm not sure there is an emerging world order. I think there's an emerging disorder as the world order that we all assumed since 1945 collapses, and it's collapsing for two reasons. One, because the United States is no longer the hegemon state able to set the rules of the world to which everyone else abides. That was part of the whole Atlanticist world that we lived in and the assumption that everyone was moving that way. Uh, and the second, and, and that is now being challenged by uh, lots of states, uh, particularly Russia and China. Uh, but secondly, it's because it's not only states, it's non-state actors, and those are two parts. There are terrorist organizations or quasi-terrorist uh, political organizations, non-state actors, but also digital technology, which I think is fundamentally disrupting everything. It's not a state actor, but by God, it's undermining everything that we do for all the reasons we've just heard. Um, so I don't think there is a, a world order um, at the moment. It is a competed world, uh, and the question is how uh, people handle that, particularly China, how it assumes, or let's put it more obliquely, what responsibilities it assumes for world leadership. What is becoming clean is that it is not prepared to take on the responsibilities that the United States has took on before. So what responsibility will it see? What will it see its role in the world? And equally, how will the United States react to that? Will it avoid Thucydides' trap, or will it be, uh, if you follow the language of the national security strategy and the national defense strategy, you'd see a more competitive, competed edge, a resistance of the rise to peer competitors, which portends a rather violent future. Having said that, talking to people who were involved in writing the national defense strategy, I understand that this was only a strategy for five to seven years, which roughly, coincidentally, uh, coincides with uh, the, the length, potentially, of Trump's presidency, uh, which means that this is a short-term policy. It's a holding action. It is not necessarily a long-term strategy, which relieves me because it seems to me that the whole strategy is economically very vulnerable given the amount of debt that the United States has had to plunge itself into to try and fund this, and it's politically vulnerable because uh, it goes against uh, the foreign policy that, uh, of the base that elected Donald Trump in the first place. If you look at what was happening on social media when uh, the president was launching his mis recent missile strikes into Syria, the violent opposition to this foreign intervention from his base people uh, will have scared him. And I think that's why he said, this is just a one-off strike. We're still pulling out of Syria. So. Wait and see on the on the uh, how the United States action. My hope would be that the United States ends up shifting to a more Kissinger, Brzezinski style accommodation with China and Russia, rather than all out straight competition, which could end up in a bloodbath. Yeah, we'd like to go back into the point of proliferation of these powerful weapons, um, uh, Mr. Lepre. Few of your colleagues at least as of your former colleagues at the uh, Obama administration, have been the target of surveillance or intelligence projects by a private Israeli company called Black Cube. Trained people with vast intelligence experience <laughs> who veteran and now are you know, making some, uh, some um, private initiative. And that goes back into the issue of supervision of these know-hows and these tools by the governments who supply them at the beginning. Are you afraid to be a target yourself of Black Cube? Well, in this particular instance, the facts are still coming out. I think, Ronan, you're even reporting uh, on this story in real time now to understand um, the details. Still yet um, to be revealed. I do think that um, it's yet another example of uh, private sector entities, and we saw this in earlier years um, with firms that were providing security support in Iraq and Afghanistan and so forth, that as, as it emerges that they are operating uh, potentially in, in ways that draw upon the skills certainly of, of trained government professionals, but potentially act in ways similar to that, oversight becomes really important in, in uh, whether it's a security firm like we saw in the mid-2000s in Iraq and Afghanistan uh, or the alleged activity that's coming out in the reporting around, around this particular instance. So I, I think it's important to run the facts down um, and for government overseers, whether in the U.S. system it's the United States Congress or others, to really think through what is the right framework to have um, that governs 
this kind of pseudo government activity in the private sector. And from oversight of private individuals into a maybe a, 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 a broad perspective of legislation on, on cyber, Ambassador Luna, do you think that the world would be able to agree on conducts of laws, of conducts of, of war on cyber, what is permitted, what is legal, what is not? Well, I think we've you know, now been spending two, four years admiring this problem, but nobody's actually working on how to deter it, how to expose it, how to regulate it, how to deal with the legal fallout from it. I am not a big believer that we will in the short term, come up with a brand new Geneva Convention. Because nobody that admits that it is involved, that the country is involved in, in, in cyber warfare. Yeah, I think there's an issue of whether governments would self constrain, how you define where the you know, boundaries between aggression and, and information exist. But I do think that you can apply some of the old deterrence learning from the nuclear debate to the hardest edge of this, whether it is making clear through signaling and intention your willingness to make it cost for the other guy if he uses it on you, and to be ready to do that and to show your tools if necessary, through working with the companies on a regulatory environment that ensures that when you see a political ad, you know who's behind it, et cetera, and there are rules of the road there, both in our nations and in free nations working together to legal strictures so that you know if you are involved in helping a foreign firm to interfere in politics of another country that you're going to go to jail for that. So I do think there's a regime to be had here. I think we have to work on it and it's a matter for government, for private sector, for um, all of us working together for the academy and for uh, the high tech sector. But it's, it's not insurmountable. We just have to get started. But um, Tamir Prado, you define this as, this as a soft nuclear weapon, but when a country bombs another country with a nuclear weapon, that has a fingerprint. Yes. When Russia, or allegedly Russia, attacked the US, it's very hard to prove. So would it be it's possible not that hard to, to prove. create? We've done plenty of proving of it. It's not that hard to prove. Yeah. We just have to do it and expose it in real time and not. But if the US has been attacked with a nuclear weapon, the US has, w would have already retaliate and the U.S. has done nothing, but, please. But if, God forbid, tomorrow, one day, um, you're going to suffer from a cyber attack that will cause something like a Chernobyl reaction into five uh, nuclear plants somewhere in the is world. Is that possible? First is that doable? All, yes, it is. And then it's a nuclear attack without fingerprints. So all your capabilities that you developed until now are useless. I believe that the, um, and I don't think that we can achieve it these days for many reasons that were elaborated just a minute ago. Um, we need something like the IAEA that we, uh, um, uh, that was started after um, Second World War when there was an understanding that nuclear capabilities uh, are really... So IAEA on cyber. And IAEA on cyber. And that's, from my point of view, the only solution if you want really to fight it and to put it in the right framework that you can use the benefit and avoid the risks, at least, to try to do it or to limit the risk. Can we achieve it today? I don't believe you need different kind of leaders to yeah. reach it. General Shaw, you seem very skeptical. Um, yes. Uh, <laughs> uh, sorry, yes, I was thinking about something else. <laughs> um, the, the cyber, the share with us. No, the cyber weapon uh, is, is potentially nuclear in its consequence, absolutely. Uh, the problem there is a burden of proof. How do you prove? I mean, everyone knows that Russia took down uh, Estonia, uh, but if you look at where the server it came from, it came from California. But nonetheless, the fingerprints are there. We, we've, we've got used to a certain level of, uh, of burden of proof, and we're trying to extrapolate that onto the cybersphere, and it doesn't work. There are different measures of proof. Uh, and furthermore, actually, 
What's going to happen here, I think, is that nation states aren't going to be the problem because in the end, nation states are themselves reliant on uh, cyber technology. The problem will be terrorist organizations that aren't reliant. You know, if someone like Boko Haram got hold of a cyber weapon, uh, they have no, you know, the, 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 the nuclear deterrent theory rested on holding an adversary's critical elements at risk. It's very easy to hold Russia's elements at risk or China's because you can hit them with cyber attacks if they hit yours. <clears throat> you cannot do that reciprocity with someone if they don't have any infrastructure to take down, but they can take down your SCADA systems, your infrastructure systems. So there's an, an, an a built in asymmetry there that the less sophisticated you are, the more invulnerable you are to cyber attack, therefore, the may, more you may want to use it. So I think states will, in fact, work it out, though, and I think that's probably why there hasn't been as much cyber aggression as there might have been because scare, states are scared of what each other's got to do. Uh, because states are actually, contrary to what you said earlier, are admitting that they do have offensive cyber weapons. Britain was very forward in saying that they had it uh, at least eight years ago when I was in charge of uh, the, the defense effort. So um, the cat, that cat is out the bag. Uh, and I think states do respect each other. They don't know how good each other is. And that, in a sense, is mutually deterring each of us. And maybe have something comforting on these uh um, on, on these alerts, uh, uh, General Kandre, the terrorist organization that India is facing is mainly old-time, old-school terrorism. You have not, if I'm, if I'm not uh, mistaken, you have not found significant cyber, nuclear uh, capabilities with, within these organizations, right? God forbid. Okay, let, uh, let me look at... Uh I will connect uh, your question along with whatever has been discussed right now. Mm -hmm. I would equate uh, the dangerous element of the nuclear weapon and the cyber at the same level, or maybe I would say cyber would be a step higher in terms of being dangerous. I will explain the reason for that. A nuclear weapon is a tangible weapon. But when you look at cyber, it is all pervasive in the society. And it does not differentiate. And there is no boundary. There is no red line. There is, you just can't understand the impact because it is like water. It's like oil. It just flows. It flows into society. Cyber is a weapon which can degrade an entire society based on the psychological warfare capability on, and influence operations. And that is where I have been trying to explain that radicalization and fanaticism, it is not a one-point strike. It builds over a period of time, and you are not even able to understand at what corner, at what level, how much of effect it has had. Same is the case in an organized sector. Cyber can take you down in your daily uh, functioning of a civilized society. And by that time, it is too late. So when we say cyber is dangerous, that's exactly where the countries have to come together, understand what are the norms of behavior beyond which that should be treated as equally dangerous to what we are doing to other nuclear weapons. I was looking for a comforting reply. <laughs> I got to the dismantling of society. Oh, wow. And, now, <laughs> and now um, about Iran. And please be as uh, short as possible, because I do have a last uh, question about your dreams. So first, um, Ambassador uh, Nuna, do you think that President Trump is going to step away? And if so, what's, gonna, what's coming next? Well, they're certainly doing everything they can to prepare everybody for him to step away and raising the drama. Maybe this is the inveterate optimism in me, I am holding out a 10% hope that at the last minute, liking drama, liking reality TV, we will get at least a six-month reprieve for the new national security team, Secretary Pompeo and National Security Advisor Bolton, to continue to work on a follow-on arrangement, at least with the Europeans. But maybe I'm, maybe I'm being an optimist. Uh, I want to hope for that. So we'll, not, we'll find out in, in three hours whether I was too optimistic. Okay. Mr. Ledra, please. Um, I was part of the administration that, that, that did so much to have this agreement in place. This is wiping out Obama's legacy. Yeah, I would make uh, three quick points on this topic. 
One is, I, I think it is important, uh, especially with former Director Pardo on the panel, to acknowledge the good, great work of the Israeli intelligence services in continuing to understand the threat of Iran and the materials that were recently um, revealed publicly, I, I think will continue to help us understand that threat picture. And I congratulate um, the Israeli intelligence services on, on, on a, very, a job very well done in that regard. Uh, number two, uh, in my view, the key question to ask about the current deal and whatever comes next is what security benefits um, does it bring? The current deal brings a certain measurable set of security benefits to the table. You may agree or disagree as to the value of those, but you can, you can articulate those security benefits to some level. It will be important to ask that question uh, after the President's announcement. What is the new approach? Does it bring tangible security benefits now? What's the probability that it will bring tangible security benefits going forward? And then third, um, and this gets a little bit to my current job in the aerospace industry, militaries in this region who are allies and partners of the United States, we all will need to continue to think about the other dimensions of Iran's behavior, uh, its pursuit of, of missiles, its um, aggressive actions in the region, and how we apply pressure back against that and build capabilities to apply pressure militarily if necessary against that. General, if U.S. steps away from the agreement and Iran also steps away from the JCPOA, would that affect the proliferation regime in your area, in your region? General Gandra. Yeah. Uh, I, I actually want to look at it differently, whether the two parties stepped away from an agreement. And like what your original question is, what do we expect and what would be a dream that we would want to see? Firstly, uh, President Trump uh, does not stick to a particular format. So I think there is a certain element of mysticism. So I think everyone should keep guessing. But what would we want to hear from him, in addition to one dimension of uh, the nuclear issue, uh, USA is too powerful and too big a uh, power to only look at one incident. It has to look at trends. It has to look at future threats that unfold. So coming to that, the nuclear part followed by the terrorism part, which includes cyber, I think that kind of an approach is what the USA should look at. And that will give them enough leeway even for future. Thank you. Tamir Pado, this, the agreement was signed when you were the, uh, the chief of the Mossad. And you are under some dispute with Prime Minister Netanyahu on how to approach it. At the end of the day, does the JCPOA fulfill the, the hopes, some hopes, little hopes, that the Israelis had for? Well, I'm out of service for the last two and a half years. But according to uh, my knowledge, reading, uh, uh, reading uh, uh, papers and watching TV, uh, there is uh, almost a full, full compliance by the Iranian with the agreement until now. Uh, I haven't seen, I haven't heard that uh, they did any major breach in that agreement since they signed it. And um, what's going to be next? OK, um, we should have another agreement at the end of the day. Um, uh, and uh, there is a say and a right one that the Iranian uh, were lying. So one thing. I, should be made clear that uh, after the United States, the USSR, China, the Brits, and the French obtained nuclear weapon, all other countries that uh, tried to obtain it, and some of them uh, uh, did it, lied while they tried to obtain it. Otherwise, they couldn't obtain it. So the, the Iranian lied, yes, they, they lied. even say that the Israelis lied. I don't know about Israel at all. Um, I am Mossad. <laughs> Not in the loop. <laughs> Not in the loop. And, uh, but uh, so they are liars. And uh, uh, there was an agreement. 
and uh, there was uh, they were monitored by the IEA. They monitored by the, all the major intelligence, uh, uh, let's say, uh, capabilities of uh, all the major parts uh, since the agreement was signed even long time before. Uh, on the base, on the assumption, they're going to lie one day. Okay, hopefully. Uh, maybe we'll see a change of regime one day, or maybe that regime will change their mind one day. But for the moment, we should keep open eyes and check it. And uh, if they're going to be the uh, dream, the agreement going to be the dream of uh, 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 Trump and uh, uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu, uh, I won't believe the Iranian either. They're going to sign whatever. Uh, uh, we want to maybe one day, but uh, at the end of the day, uh, our assumption should be they're going to lie, and they're going to make uh, uh, effort to reach uh, uh, that nuclear capability. So we have to monitor them. At least that should be the assumption, unless one day we we'll understand that they understood that it's a waste of time. And uh, I think that uh, they will reach that point. And I think that uh, after um, they signed the agreement, and everything is a matter of timing, uh, they started to fight against ISIS shoulder to shoulder uh, with the Western countries, with the Americans, with the Brits, without talking to them on a basic day, but they had the same target, to defeat ISIS. And they had they played a major role in Mosul. They played a major role in Iraq all over Iraq. They made a, page, a, a major role in Syria itself to fight those, uh, uh, those uh, 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 ISIS uh, uh, um, terrorists. So for them, it was the chance to become part of the world. Of the international community. The international community. And they did it. So now we have to think what's going to be the next step. General Shaw, very brief, I, I assume, coming from Britain, you support the continuation of the JCPOA. And I also assume that President Trump is watching us now at the live feed of the uh, <laughs> Pritzlia <laughs> Interdisciplinary <laughs> Center. So this is the very last chance, your chance, to convince him, but be very brief, because we have another question coming, to convince him not to step away. Um, I think that's impossible because uh, he's promised it to his base and it's part of Obama's legacy. So I think it's in his, in his DNA to, to get rid of the deal. Uh, I, think, I think doing so would be bad for itself. I think it's bad for Western coherence because, as you said, we're all uh, in favor of it. Uh, it pushes Iran into Russia and China's hands. Uh, it pushes EU into the Eurasian uh, sphere, away from the Atlantic sphere, go back to my global trend I, I see coming. And it also discredits future Korean deals. So I suppose you're right. If I was to say one thing to Trump, it would say, listen, if you want the, if you want the Nobel Peace Prize for doing a deal uh, with the Koreans to get rid of their weapons, don't discredit the whole concept of do deals by scrapping the one that your predecessor gave. And that will earn you a Nobel Peace Prize. That could that, be that's it. a good idea. I'm sure that he really wants to have the Nobel Prize. I'm sure he does. And last question, very, very brief to each one of you. Your intelligence dream, the one bit of intelligence, the crown jewels, the one thing that you really want your country, your intelligence service to have, this one bit, this huge revelation, a game changer. Best, no, no, no. I don't know about the US intelligence service, but I would guess they need this too. I want the rest of the world's intelligence service to know what's going on in the private conversations in the Oval Office now between President Trump Secretary Pompeo and National Security Advisor Bolton, are they succeeding in taking a more strategic view now that we have a new team, or are we going to lurch from tactical adventure to tactical adventure and not fulfill our obligations as a world leader? Okay, intercepting the White House, that's good. Marcel Antro. I'd, I'd love to have um, a uh, three hour, uh, somewhat whiskey-fueled, honest conversation with either Vladimir Putin or President Xi Jinping about how they see their country's role in the world, uh, honestly, and their vision, strategic vision for the, for the future. OK, great. General Kondra, the uh, like few hours with the chief of the ISI in a windowsless <laughs> room. Uh, actually, chief of the ISI is the one who drives everything and uh, would like to know what is going on in his mind 
for the present and also connect with what he did in the past. Tamir Pado. To sit with Qasem Soleimani <laughs> and <laughs> try to convince him to do the right thing. A meeting with Qasem Soleimani, the chief of the Al Quds Brigade of the Revolutionary Guard. General Shaw. Uh, I'd like to know what the hell's going to happen with Brexit. <laughs> 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 All right.